All right, I'm just gonna wait for uh, some of the attendees to populate here and uh, we'll go like that. All right, I'm gonna give it a few seconds more. It looks like there's some people being admitted right now. <clears throat> okay. All right, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and begin our meeting. Uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, welcome to the Community Advisory Council meeting for June 7th, 2021. Uh, I'm the chair, uh, Evan Zellig. Uh, we're joined tonight by our CAC. We have also the uh, director of Iolero, Carly Navarro, our uh, sheriff's office liaison, Brandon Cutting, Lieutenant Brandon Cutting, uh, and uh, Adriana Call is uh, assisting us as well. Uh, so just uh, to, before we get into uh, everything, I'd like to see if we can do a uh, roll call. Um, Lorena, will you uh, do a roll call for today's meeting? Of course. Uh, Council Member Bailey. Present. Council Member Estrada. Present. Council Member Hernandez. Um, that's David Hernandez, looks like he's not here. Council Member Landa Verde. Present. Council Member Roman Diaz. Present. Council Member Wood. Present, Woods with an S. Oh, sorry about that, my apologies. I'm Vice Chair Barrera and um, Chair Zelig. I am here as well and uh, thank you. And we're also joined by uh, Kaori Hernandez, one of our interns as well. Um, okay, are there any changes to the agenda that anybody has or are there any issues, Adriana, uh, with our agenda that needs to be addressed or, or changed at all? Oh, I think you're muted. I have not been given any changes. Okay, great. Um, then we will look at approval of our minutes from the last meeting. Um, first, I want to open up for public comment regarding the approval of our agenda minutes. Uh, I will say that for public comment for both this uh, part as well as public comment in general, that members of the public are free to address the CAC. Public comments should fall under the subject matter jurisdiction of the CAC and public comments are time limited. Time limitations are at the discretion of the chair and uh, co-chair and may be adjusted to accommodate all speakers. In addition to public comment, the community is also invited to communicate with Iolero staff and CAC members through email. Members of the public who would like to make statements that may exceed time limits, suggest topics to be placed on future agenda or suggest questions to be raised uh, may send an email addressing these matters to cac at sonomacounty.org, and that's sonoma-county.org. CAC members may not deliberate or take action on any items not on the agenda, and generally may only listen to public comment. Should CAC members wish to deliberate on an issue, that issue may be placed on a future agenda for CAC discussion and possible action. Materials related to an items on the agenda submitted to the CAC after distribution of this packet are available for public inspection in the Iolero office during normal business hours. Um, I'm going to, uh, before approval of our minutes, open up for public comment. This is solely regarding the approval of our minutes from the last meeting and public comment only for purposes of discussing the minutes from the last meeting. Uh, if there is anybody who wishes to give public comment in this regard, please raise your hand on the Zoom app and we will uh, call you and admit you for public comment. Okay, I do not see any hands raised for this purpose. Is there a motion of somebody who was present at the last meeting to approve the minutes of that meeting? 
I'll move to approve the minutes as written. Thank you. That's a motion from uh, Lorena Barrera. Is there a second from somebody who was present at the last meeting to approve the uh, minutes of the last meeting? I'll second, Evan. And that's a second from Lorez Bailey. Um, all those in favor of approval? Aye. 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 And Jose, and I see Jose. And all those uh, not in favor? I hear none. Uh, therefore, the meeting minutes of the last meeting of the CAC are approved and entered. Um, at this time, I would like to just move it into the next one. All right. At this time, I would like to uh, introduce and uh, make some comments regarding the appointments and reappointments of some new CAC members. Uh, we do have two of our members who have been reappointed. The first is Lorez Bailey from the second district. Lorez, is there uh, anything that you would like to say to introduce yourself or reintroduce yourself uh, to both the CAC and the public or any comments you'd like to make? Uh, no, just briefly, just wanna say thank you uh, once again for the opportunity to serve on the CAC and it's been really good work done the last year and I'm just really um, appreciate the opportunity to continue the work. Great. Thank you, Lorez. Uh, next again, uh, being reappointed is Lorena Barrera, uh, who is appointed for the third district. Uh, Lorena is currently our vice chair. And Lorena, if there's anything that you would like to uh, say both to the uh, CAC and to the public, uh, if you'd like to reintroduce yourself or, or give any comment at this time. Um, I just want to thank Supervisor Corsi for giving me the opportunity to stay on the Community Advisory Council. I think we're doing really important work. And um, I'm really happy to uh, be on here and continue to do the work for the community for the following two years. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and next we have a new uh, member of our CAC recently appointed from the third district, that's Nzinga Woods. Uh, if you would like to please tell the CAC and the public a little bit about yourself and uh, uh, allow yourself to be welcome to the CAC and, and please, uh, Introduce yourself. Hi, well, thank you for the um, opportunity to serve on this board. Uh, my name is Nzinga Woods, and I currently work as co-director for the Art Quiz program at Santa Rosa High School, where I've taught for about 10 years. Uh, in addition to that, uh, just being a native of Northern California, I say just working between or moving or living between um, the Bay Area and Sacramento. Uh, again, I've done a lot of community engagement work and arts education activities. So. Um, really invested in the community and supporting um, the development of all folks in the community. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Ms. Woods. Uh, and again, th those are our newly appointed and reappointed CAC members. Uh, I believe that the uh, Board of Supervisors is in the process of going through and making reappointments uh, or new appointments of those on the CAC. Uh, we are still waiting to hear from a few of the other supervisors regarding uh, their appointments or reappointments. And uh, certainly as members are appointed, we will reintroduce them or introduce them for the first time uh, here at their next available meeting. Thank you. Uh, so at this time, I'm going to open up the meeting to public comment. This public comment is solely regarding the introduction of new and reappointed CAC appointees. If you would like to comment on the appointment of any of these three individuals or the appointments uh, that are upcoming of our CAC, uh, now is the time to offer public comments on those subjects. If you would like to, please raise your hand on the Zoom app and I will call you so we can admit you to give uh, statements. And I do not see any hands raised for public comment regarding agenda item number two. Therefore, seeing no hands, digital or otherwise, I will move on to item number three on our agenda. This is uh, the bulk of our agenda today. It's to discuss the policy recommendations, the intended policy recommendations of the CAC 
to the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office um, for purposes of uh, modification and changing of their policy. Uh, what I think we're going to do for this purpose is we are going to uh, have first uh, a presentation on the de-escalation policy that was discussed as part of the de-escalation ad hoc committee. Uh, from there, we will go through the use of force. Uh, there's four policy recommendations for use of force and related items. We will present those and discuss those. And then uh, following that, we will open it up to a discussion amongst the CAC to discuss these uh, policy recommendations, things we like, don't like, uh, information that we see that was not included that should be, stuff that is included that we don't want to include. Really, this is our opportunity to discuss the policies as we intend to present them, um, or, or at least as we intend to further discuss them with hopes of presenting them soon at our July meeting. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we got to this point since the what we are doing today is really a, a, a large majority of the work of the CAC. Uh, this year, throughout the year, we have been working uh, with our interns from Sonoma State University. Uh, Corey Hernandez is here. Uh, we had other interns that were helping us throughout the year. And what we were doing is going through uh, policy recommendations that we want to make to the sheriff's office. The last time the CAC presented policy recommendations to the sheriff, uh, a lot of them were rejected. And a lot of them seemed to have been rejected because they may not have been supported by evidence-based information that would allow a sheriff's office to look at those recommendations, look at how it may be applied in other jurisdictions or other um, or, or treated in other reviews. And it allows the sheriff now to take new recommendations that are backed by evidence from other counties, from uh, law journals, from other laws within the United States. Uh, and what we're doing is making these recommendations with the evidence to back them up in hopes that they will now be accepted by the sheriff. Uh, for now, we have, in addition to the de-escalation, four policy recommendations that we are focusing on. These policy recommendations were discussed in our ad hoc groups. Uh, over the past several months, we have discussed them as far as what specific policies we want to focus on with use of force. Uh, we then had our interns and our CAC members go through all 58 counties in California and look at the policies of those counties to determine what other jurisdictions similar in demographic makeup to Sonoma County have the policies that we want. And if they did, we looked at those jurisdictions so that we could find out how those policies were implemented in those various counties. For uh, jurisdictions that did not have the policies in place, uh, we looked for other law review articles, other legal sources, um, and other ways that we could find uh, support for our policies. We didn't want to just make recommendations without support. Uh, and the recommendations we have now, I feel, are supported in a way that allows the sheriff to um, know where we're coming from with these policies. So that's how we got to where we are. Uh, it's not I know for the people in, in the public, they don't see our ad hoc meetings, they don't see our, um, our de-escalation ad hocs or our use of force ad hocs. And so this is where we want to be able to present to the CAC as well as the public what we've been doing in those meetings so that everything is uh, clear and transparent and so that everything can then be discussed in the open before we take the next step of presenting these to the sheriff's office. Um, I would like to open up now, I believe, to uh, Lorena Barrera. Uh, Ms. Barrera will be describing and presenting our de-escalation policy uh, so that we can have discussions on that policy. 
Thank you, Chair Zellig. So um, the proposed policies were published with the agenda several days in advance. And if you, if everyone turns to page four of the PDF that was um, uploaded on the website, that's where the de-escalation um, proposed policy starts. So page four through seven. So I just um, wrote um, a little bit of what I wanted to read in regards to how we got to this point. And a lot of it was already mentioned by Chair Zellig. So our ad hocs actually began doing um, all of the research in March, 2020. Um, we were doing research on other counties in California. We decided that it was important to find counties with population and geographical areas that are similar to Sonoma County. And we did run into some difficulties in finding counties to compare to because there weren't any counties um, specific to de-escalation that had an actual de-escalation policy that was um, different from what Sonoma County already had. And um, when we did our research, Sonoma County's de-escalation um, information or policy was specific in the crisis intervention training section of the um, policy that they currently use. So um, from presenting um, our conflicts and discussing this with the director, um, we determined that we needed to propose maybe an overarching de-escalation policy. And that's where um, the work began. And now you have what we're presenting today. So um, that policy that you see starting on page four uses resources that are recommended and have standing in this type of work. Um, so you'll see stuff from Post, the US Department of Justice. Um, and after having um, many meetings in the past 15 months, we're proposing that um, the de-escalation policy that is before you is what we approve and present to the sheriff's department for their consideration and approval. So um, if you read through what we are presenting today, you'll see that the policy explains de-escalation. It breaks, breaks down the term. It provides strategy information. It also includes four concepts and provides techniques. Um, the four concepts that are mentioned are for de-escalation include self-control, effective communication, scene assessment and management, and um, force options. And all of that is important when it comes to de-escalation. So um, we think this is a great proposal and we wanna see if there's any feedback or comments um, regarding what is being presented. And um, otherwise we'd like to have this approved and presented to the Sheriff's Department for their consideration and approval and adoption, sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, what I will do now is open our discussion up to the CAC. Uh, I'd like to hear from our members who have uh, read the de-escalation policy we've sent out. What I'm going to do is we're gonna go through all of these as a CAC, um, as the council, we're going to discuss all of these and then open it up to public comment. And so at this time for, for the de-escalation uh, policy, uh, is there anybody who would like to make comment or offer anything regarding the de-escalation policy that has been uh, drafted and is intended for, uh, for presentation to the sheriff? I don't see any hands. Um, if we don't see how, it, sorry, Jose, I can't tell if that, if. No, I was saying, I thought Lorez wanted to say something. <laughs> thank you, Jose. Uh, no, Lorez. Right. I just wanted to thank the de-escalation committee because you know we've been doing our work uh, parallel to each other. And so I know they've been meeting, so to finally see the final product of their work. And what I really appreciate, just not along with the recommendations, but the, the, the concepts behind the escalation and the defining, I really appreciate. And um, just thank you for all your work. This sure. is really a really important category. Um, 
Lieutenant Cutting, uh, you know, I've, I've opened this up to our CAC, but certainly you're here as part of these discussions for, um, for this meeting. Uh, certainly, if there's anything that you at this point want to add or, or offer regarding the de-escalation uh, policy, uh, please uh, don't hesitate and, and, and raise your hand if, if you would like to offer anything regarding this policy as well. I can just say real quick in reviewing it, I've, I've had about a week looking through it and it's a ton of great information, a lot of great references. Uh, the, the topic is, is very important. It is very um, current. We're discussing this a lot. There's a lot of post standards coming down about this. So the timing of it is, is spot on as well. That's about all I'd have to say about it right now. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else on our CAC who has comments on, at, at this point, just the de-escalation policy that we intend to uh, offer to the Sheriff's Office? No? Okay. Um, then- Just wanna, we're... sorry, Evan. I know, okay. um, I know we have some board members that were previously on the CAC, and I just wanna say that we really learned a lot from all of the work that they did. Um, just, from what they presented and things like that, we kind of felt that it was important to provide uh, policy recommendations that had um, reliable sources and acceptable um, accredited uh, sources in our recommendations so that you know our work uh, goes a long way. And so I think that it's harder to turn something down when you're presenting the information and showing where everything came from. And, and like you said, um, evidence-based information. So I think even though um, sometimes the community would mention that it seemed like, you know, we didn't have a lot going on, it, it does take a lot of time to gather all of the information, do all of the research and all of that. So I just want to note that all of that is in here. It It's just very time consuming, but we did learn a lot from all of the work that was done in the past. So thank you for, for that. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, going now to, uh, we're gonna go then to our use of force, uh, our different policies regarding use of force. These were policies that were discussed, uh, researched and drafted through our ad hoc a committee that was uh, focusing on use of force. Um, as a member of that ad hoc, I can tell um, our, our CAC and essentially what we did is again, we went through all 58 communities and counties in California. We looked at areas that needed attention regarding use of force policies here in Sonoma County. And we started with the other 58 counties uh, looking for other uh, jurisdictions that were close in demographics to Sonoma County, uh, but certainly not restricting ours. We were looking at all counties. We were looking then uh, nationally uh, as well to see uh, whether the areas that we were focusing on uh, were other areas that other places and other communities were also bringing light to and, and wanting to address as part of their policy changes. Who's done it previously, who's in the process of doing it now. Um, and, and again, what we did is we came up with policies that we feel would be good recommendations uh, to make to the sheriff's office to change their current policies uh, in, in various ways. The four policies that we have at this time relate to the issue and the topics of canines, uh, police canines, uh, firearms, and specifically the display or unholstering and pointing of a firearm. We looked at uh, mass demonstrations, crowd management, and the use of tear gas. Uh, that was a discussion that was brought much more to life uh, after recent civil unrest and protests uh, in Sonoma County, as well as, as nationally, nationally um, largely uh, following the George Floyd homicide. Uh, we uh, started focusing on that because of everything that happened in our community after those and during those protests. Uh, and then we also looked at something that is becoming uh, and is an extremely important topic. It's the prone restraint and maximum prone restraint, where an individual is uh, subject to police detention and is on their uh, 
is on their stomach essentially, uh, and all of the ways in which being positioned in that manner uh, can result in harm to that subject and to that person. And so we wanted to look at what is the best way that we can make sure the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office um, does not have issues when it comes to um, prone restraints, positional asphyxia, uh, asphyxia uh, and other related issues. Uh, so first we're gonna uh, turn towards the canine policy. Uh, the canine policy is one that um, has drawn a lot of attention lately. There have been some uh, cases, uh, Mr. Wyrick's case that was recently in the news. Um, there are others being reported to Iolero, uh, specifically regarding the canines and the canines attacking when they are not supposed to, uh, that they are apprehending people who are in the process of surrendering, uh, and of course, uh, an issue of the canines failing to release when their handlers are instructing and, and ordering them to do so. And so we wanted a policy, and I know Lorez worked uh, a great deal on this policy as well. Uh, we wanted a policy that would address those issues. Uh, I, I trust again that all of our CAC has had the opportunity to review the policy. Uh, and, and I'd like to open up our uh, discussions on the canine policy to our members of the CAC at this time. Um, I, I would note just uh, initially, my one of the biggest things for me in this policy is what's added to the second paragraph, specifically regarding the failure of a canine to disengage uh, from a person that it is that the canine is biting. Um, either with unintended bites or bites that were intentional and then the canine is, dis is not disengaging. Uh, we are proposing as the CAC that uh, any failure to disengage uh, unintended bites or injuries uh, should result in the canine being terminated from duty. And that the handler in a situation like this should undergo additional training and recertification. And so we're putting that out there for our CAC and, and of course later for our public to discuss. Uh, and I, again, I'd like to open it up for discussions with our CAC if anybody has comments on this proposed um, proposal recommendation. Um, uh, I just wanna say thank you for um, putting this together. I think this is great. Um, I do appreciate what you said about um, the K-9 and uh, like being removed when basically it doesn't follow orders and to have additional training for the officers because um, from what I've heard in the past some of the commands are like done in other languages or things like that so anything can happen in the process and just retraining the the deputy and then handling the um, service dog I think is really important to address both um, basically officers in this case. Yeah, and you, you know, my, the way I understand these canines are trained to disengage and, and not just by verbal commands, but they have backups as well. Uh, for example, a shock collar or a collar that will allow the handler to release the canine from the subject being, um, being encountered. The issue I have is in a situation, for example, like Mr. Wyricks, where we have a canine who is given verbal commands to disengage, it doesn't do so. It's given uh, the backup toggle with the collar, which is an electronic command that should be telling that uh, canine to disengage in addition to the verbal commands of the handler. If two things do not work and that canine after not just verbal commands, but the backup uh, electronic shock collar doesn't work, that's, not a, that's a canine who now has failed to follow its handler's commands twice. The first time with verbal, the second time with the electronic means. Um, and in that case, I do believe that it would be best for that dog to be taken out of service. Um, I know that there is a tremendous amount of training that goes into training these dogs. It's inexcusable that a dog with that much training would fail to follow both the commands and the backup commands of their handler. 
And I think in a situation where that ha happens, um, and certainly in a situation where we have a, a member of our community who was extremely injured by the failure of that canine to release, um, I don't think that's a canine who should be allowed to remain in service. Um, and so, uh, you know, if, if there's anybody on the CAC who uh, disagrees with that, let's, let's have it be known so that we can figure out what we want to do with this recommendation. But at this point, that, that is our recommendation uh, for the sheriff's office. Does anybody, yeah, yeah, Jose? I, this is probably one of the ones that had the hardest time just because it's, it's a service dog, you know, and there's so many intangibles. There's some could be sensitive and every atmosphere is different. But after, you know, reading the case, uh, the, the recent cases, um, I think they are, they are reasonable uh, because yes, there are backup commands as, as we read. And so, no, I mean, as much as I'm a dog lover and, uh, and I, I love that we're utilizing canines for some of these. Yes, I, I, I think that it is reasonable that if both of those two commands, there definitely should be a curtailing of the service of that dog. And yeah, retraining. So I, I, I do concur. It's not that I had in that, but I did have a hard time, you know, coming to that conclusion with it. Yeah, and and again, I, I I thought a lot about it because again, I do know that a lot of these canines are are very, very uh, well trained. They're supposed to be well trained, and so coming to that extreme measure of taking it out of service uh, is only because. I, I have learned more about how these canines are meant to disengage. And when they fail to do so after the multiple commands and the multiple ways in which they get it, uh, I, I feel it, it's, it's at that point. Um, and, and certainly the trainer has a lot to do with that and which is why they should also have to go through recertification and retraining. Because if the verbal commands of the handler aren't working, um, it's either the dog or the handler and uh, both need to have that addressed. Uh, anybody else uh, wish to offer any uh, comments regarding this canine policy? Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if the canine um, doesn't listen to verbal command and then doesn't respond to the caller, does it get like a second opportunity? Like, um, you know, sometimes I think I don't know if it's just dogs feel like doing whatever they want. My dogs are trained and right now I'm currently disciplining them because they're not behaving. So I'm not really trying to compare them to a dog that has all kinds of training, but it's like sometimes they already know what they're supposed to do. And then there could be something going on that we don't know about that makes them act a certain way. So if they have like, is it like a three strike policy or or how many opportunities would a dog get before it's basically taken out of service? Or would it just be in a single incident where they fail both um, the verbal commands and then the additional um, things that control them, I guess, is my question. Yeah, and I, I think as part of our policy that we're recommending, it's, it's when those bites are causing injury uh, and when it's the, when that canine has a failure to disengage or unintentionally bites. So it's, it's when they are not doing what they're supposed to do and it results in harm to the individual who was, who was encountered by this canine. Um, you know, certainly we don't wanna remove good canines from police service without just cause. And, and I think at the time, you know, what we're putting in these policies is that, uh, it's after they do things that are unintended and cause injury because of that. Um, yeah, and, and certainly I, I'd like to hear, you know, when we hear back from the sheriff, uh, I'd like to hear what the sheriff has, uh, uh, you know, what their thoughts are about this. I'm, I'm certain they're not going to want their police dogs removed from uh, service. Uh, however, I, I always go back to thinking of the, um, the standard for police officers and how we, we must hold police officers and canine officers to, to a higher degree than, than citizens. And the reality is if my dog attacked somebody who was not attacking that dog or who was not posing a threat and caused injury or bit that dog, my dog would be found to be a vicious animal and would likely be put down. We're not asking for the canines to be put down, but 
with a police canine, there is that higher standard. And if a police canine is going to attack somebody who is not harming them or causing any harm or, or presenting a risk to them, and they cause injury, I don't feel that that uh, canine should be treated any different uh, or certainly to a lesser degree than a civilian's dog. Uh, that is a trained uh, dog with a, an intended purpose. And uh, if it's not going to meet that purpose and follow its training, it, it shouldn't be doing its job. So that's that's kind of where we're at with these policies. Yeah, Jose, uh, Mr. One more, one more question as a follow-up. Do we know if all of the training happens at one facility or is it multiple facilities around the nation or California? Lieutenant Cutting can probably speak to that a little bit better. I, I don't believe it's all at one facility for all canines. I believe there are multiple canine training facilities throughout the country uh, and it just depends on, on their canines. I'm not sure specifically about Sonoma counties and if they're trained at different locations, uh, but I know there's not one, uh, one set training. Um, Lieutenant Cutting, are you able to offer any uh, information about that? The post, uh, the initial training is is done at various locations. They're all post certified. They're lengthy, um, several. I believe it's five to six weeks, maybe eight weeks. I don't have it in front of me. Um, out of sight, and it's not local. The ongoing training we have every every department that has canines has what we refer to as a master trainer, and that master trainer is regional, and so we have a a regional master trainer that most of the Sonoma County agencies share. Okay, thank you. Anybody else uh, have any comment regarding the canine policy? I had one oh, yes. or, right. or a right. thought. Um, so I thought that one of the most interesting parts too was the, the explanation of find and bite, find and bark and bite and hold. Um, and I just had a question why you why you all went on the route with whenever possible should employ find and bark um so when is find and bite kind of like what was the thought process of that i understand so you're asking more specifically the words whenever possible handlers should employ a find and bark rather than find and bite approach um what's the approach that's usually done right now do we know I believe it is find and bark initially. Uh, I believe that is what should be used and then progressing from there. I believe the words whenever possible are there because we could think of a situation where it might arise where a sheriff's canine approaches a situation and there is already somebody in grave danger requiring find and bite. Um, however, certainly that is not the initial approach and, and should not be the starting point. Uh, but I believe the words whenever possible are there uh, to allow for the uh, for, allow for the possibility uh, that a find and bite initial approach may be necessary in a limited circumstance. Um, certainly, if that's something where the whenever possible lines um, that we want to change the language, I, I, I'm let's talk about that. It's just just a thought of why find and bark isn't like the default that is done. Um, but also, I. I, I wasn't part of the use of force, so I don't know if there was conversations behind that. I don't know if there was conversation specifically about, um, you know, whenever possible being a find and bark. Uh, Lorez, uh, Ms. Bailey, can you, add, uh, can you add anything to this? I know you, you looked a lot at the canines as well. Yeah, I don't have an answer for Dora specifically for what she's asking, so maybe Brandon can fill in. The only thing I do want to respond to, sorry, Dora, I don't have an answer for you, but to respond to back to what Lorena was saying about, you know, is it a one-time incident, severe incident, and then the dog's out of service? Um, and, you know, what does that look like? So I think there can be some conversation there. But for me, more than anything, it comes back to accountability. If you don't feel like there's going to be ramifications for, um, uh, I don't want to say bad behavior, inappropriate, untrained behavior, of your canine and you don't think there's ramifications for that, then there's never anything to hold you accountable when those things happen because we know that officers 
how passionate, how much they love their canines and how much they love their dogs um, with them. You know, we hear about how they're part of their families. We hear about how they take them home and have them around their children and they really become embedded in their lives. So I want those same officers to feel like I, my dog needs to be very well trained and prepared for situations so that I don't have to lose my dog, right? If you don't have some type of accountability or ramifications of things, then you won't think about it. Now, in terms of what that looks like, um, back to what Lorena was asking about, you know, is it, okay, three incidents, two incidents? That, you know, I don't know, but I just think there needs to be um, accountability around that. Yeah, and I, and I do, looking at the canines, um, looking at the policy now, it looks, we, we do have to adjust some of the language. Um, the one I'm looking at says, any failure to disengage unintended bites or injury caused by a canine, including but not limited to bites of an unintended subject, bites resulting in significant injury or bites to the head, neck, or groin. So it's, it's the unintended bites um, and the failure to disengage. So it's not, you know, it's not a dog who is, a, who is engaging with a subject that properly should be engaged with and then releases when their canine handler orders them to be released. These are subjects who have been caused injury by the canine. They are unintended bites for a subject that should not have been bitten by that dog and that dog then fails to be released. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's not just every time a dog bites somebody. And so I think um, that there is some of that built in, but it sounds like uh, Miss Bailey and, and some of the others want possibly to to have a little more clarification on, on how many times the dog can do this before it's truly out. And I think that's something we'll have to discuss further in our, in our ad hoc, unless, you know, I'd, I'd like to discuss it here and we'll certainly uh, hear from our, our public as well during public comment uh, about whether that's something we should uh, work in there as far as a kind of a three strikes you're out or a two strikes or, or just the first time. Um, but but I, I understand that's uh, that's what's being asked. Yes, Ms. Bailey. Can I have, ask a question? Since we're having this conversation, we do have Brandon here. Yeah. Going back to you know why a dog does not release, why a dog would even with all those uh, backup things, what is that? Is could you? I mean, do you attribute that to a, a training, to a dog's personality, a fluke, um, the handler? So I think that like we could probably use some clarification on why that would happen. If you're asking me, I, I yeah. think it's going to be an individual. It's going to depend on the circumstances of that call, of that bite. Um, all of our dogs, if it's a unintended or if the dog has a failure, um, they're pulled out of service and they are they have to be recertified. Uh, there's some training that goes along with it currently. Um, it, it's an individual basis. Uh, it could be handler, it could be the canine, it could be circumstances. Um, I, it, would, it would totally depend on that particular instance. And uh, Lieutenant Cutting, my understanding is that when a dog is taken out of service like that and recertified, that that process can happen very quickly, the recertification process. It's not an extensive retraining of that canine, uh, but rather a, a recertification almost to just make sure it doesn't do what it just did again. Is that accurate? It, it totally depends on what it is that happened. Um, it could be fast, it could be a small problem, it could be a big problem. It, it would completely depend that the retraining and the certification would be based on what that dog did or what the handler did and how and why, and that would be addressed. Um, it is addressed, it is, then the dog is recertified to be brought back into duty and then it progresses on in its, in its training. Do, um, do you know by any chance how, um, how many times they will recertify or retrain a canine before they do take it out of service? For example, if, uh, if a canine is found to need recertification, how many times will they keep redoing that with the same canine? Yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer for you. I don't have a set number. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not on the canine program. Our policy doesn't state a number of, of um, accidental or, or uh, mis, mis, misguided bites, uh, so to speak. 
So I think it would depend. Uh, obviously, liability would come in the more it happens. So um, our trainers, our master trainers are going to look at each one of those instances. And if the dogs continue, if it made a mistake over and over again, it would be directly addressed and a decision would have to be made. But I, again, I'm not a part of that program. I just have to look at the policy and talk to those guys. Thank you. Um, okay, opening uh, back to our CAC, uh, Ms. Roman Diaz, uh, Ms. Woods, any comments uh, on this uh, canine policy before we move on to the next uh, subject? No comments for me. Thank you. And no comments for me. Great, thank you both. Um, okay, so um, again, we'll, we're gonna hear from our public as well in the community to find out what they may want added or, or removed and, and what their thoughts are on it. Um, but next we're gonna turn to our firearms policy. Uh, this was a policy that was discussed in our ad hocs. Specifically, we were looking and, and discussing about the fact that in Sonoma County, when a firearm is drawn, it is not required to be reported. Uh, and specifically when a firearm is drawn to gain compliance from a subject, the simple drawing of that firearm is not recorded or reported as a use of force or something that must be noted. And it's something that, you know, we talked about our ad hoc, how when you're encountering somebody, a police officer, and that police officer is even putting their hand on their gun and, and unholstering that firearm, what that does to the person on the other end and how the uh, individual who is facing that police officer would automatically think that by an officer unholstering their firearm, that officer has now increased their use of force. They have taken that encounter to a different level. And we felt that it was necessary that those, uh, that the drawing of a firearm specifically with the intent to gain compliance from a subject should now be a, uh, a reportable matter that will have to go in the reports uh, and uh, can be addressed. And so that we know how often the police are drawing their weapons against subjects. And more importantly, so that we know from the subjects when somebody is having a, a, a firearm drawn at them that it is reported and being addressed properly. Um, and so what we've intended and what we've written is that de-escalation should take place before resorting to the use of firearm. And that's where our overreaching de-escalation policy and all the other steps of de-escalation would come in, such that before an officer or deputy takes the step of drawing a firearm, they've gone through the de-escalation techniques before getting to that point. Uh, we describe in the policy that once you draw a firearm, it limits an officer's alternatives to control a situation. It increases the amount of anxiety that members of the public have that the other individual facing that officer now has. And once you take the step of drawing that or unholstering that firearm, uh, you now increase the chances of an unwarranted or unintentional discharge of that firearm. For those reasons, we've indicated that any intentional pointing of a firearm at an individual by a deputy should be reported as it is considered a use of force. Um, we would like the circumstances of such a display of a firearm to be documented. Uh, we would like those documented occurrences to be reviewed as a use of force, just like any other use of force report would be done up the chain of command through the sheriff's department. Um, and we specifically indicate that the firearms shall not be drawn or directed at a person unless that person is presenting a danger. And more specifically, no threats to shoot if a person is compliant and not presenting a danger. And that firearms must always be holstered by a member, uh, by a deputy attempting to frisk or handcuff a subject. And so really the main focus of this firearms policy is the documentation and the review by sheriff's employees and the cha uh, chain of custody, I'm sorry, the um, chain of command for purposes of documenting use of force. Um, and for 
understanding how the drawing of a firearm and pointing it at an individual changes a situation and increases both the risk and anxieties of, of all those involved. So I'd like to open this up to the CAC now for a discussion. If there's anybody who has comments uh, on this proposed recommendation regarding the display of firearms. Okay, I see no comments uh, at this time. Does anybody have issue with the wording of the way that this is presented uh, or any of the substantive content of what we are asking the sheriff's office to have to do when uh, this takes place? Any issues? No, okay. Then we'll move on to the next one and certainly uh, open this up again for public comment shortly so that we can uh, hear from our public. <clears throat> the next one that we're uh, discussing and that we intend to recommend to the sheriff's office is regarding the mass demonstrations, crowd management and use of tear gas. Uh, it is a, a little bit of a lengthy policy. It's about four pages. We have, as part of this policy, uh, as well as with the other ones, tried to include as many citations as possible to legal sources, law review articles, uh, government policies of other jurisdictions, other law enforcement agencies, the penal code sections, uh, the model use of force from the NYU School of Law Policing Project, the California Assembly. We've really, throughout this policy and the others as well, are giving the sheriff all of the citations and all of the evidence-based information so that we, when we make these recommendations, the sheriff knows where we're getting this information from and exactly why we're making these recommendations. Uh, so for those on our CAC who have had the opportunity now to review these, um, I'd like to open up the discussion to any comments or any information that you would like to talk about regarding the mass demonstrations, crowd management, and use of tear gas. Um, and I would also note that all of these policies, um, in the preparation of these policies, we did have the opportunity to discuss uh, with Lieutenant Cutting some of our thoughts on the policies and while discussing mass demonstrations and crowd management, we were able to learn a little bit about uh, how the sheriff's office operates with the staging of their officers and deputies uh, to when they are actually called for handling of mass gathering and crowd control situations. We were able to talk to Lieutenant Cutting about a lot of the um, protests that they have in Sonoma County and a lot of the protests which are organized by uh, the organizers who call in advance. They make arrangements for the protest, where it's going to be, approximately how many people. Um, and they speak to the deputies and the sheriff's office so that a lot of times when these protests are taking place, uh, there's a mutual agreement between the group protesting and the sheriff's office about how it will happen and also about how the sheriff will engage with any individuals who are stepping over that line um, to a point where arrests need to be made. Um, so that is taken into consideration as part of this policy. But we also know that sometimes civil unrest and protests happens because it's called for and there is no discussion with the sheriff's office needed in advance. And people are gonna protest because they're pissed and injustices are happening and the people want to be heard. And in those situations, the sheriff's office should be handling themselves in the same way that they are with a planned protest. And what we wanted to do is get a policy in place where the sheriff's department knows and where the public knows exactly what's going to happen in a mass demonstration, crowd management, uh, civil unrest and protest situation, such that when there are violations of that policy, uh, there can be some just uh, some uh, there can be some way to hold people accountable 
And when policies are not being, uh, not being followed and are being violated, we have specific policies to find the sheriffs accountable um, and punishment that can then be handed down. Without the policies written down and properly in place, policy violations can't be found by Iolero and punishment cannot be recommended. And so um, this is what we've come up with. It talks about a lot. Uh, it talks about um, body-worn cameras, how to deal with the press and journalists, how to disperse uh, unlawful assemblies, the use of tear gas and other uh, quote unquote non-lethal um, weapons uh, and, uh, and so forth. And so I'm opening this up for discussion. I know there's been a lot of talk about these mass demonstrations and, and gatherings and how the sheriff handled those or, or, or ways in which they didn't handle them properly. We've heard recently from the uh, Human Rights Commission on matters relating to the Santa Rosa protests, which involved our sheriff's department in many regards. Uh, and so um, let's open this up to the CAC. Any comments or, or discussion at this time? And, and, and again, if we don't hear comments from our CAC, these were discussed at length in our ad hoc meetings. So there were discussions there. Uh, what we're allowing now is for more of an open discussion. If there's anything that our CAC wants changed, corrected, modified, um, or, or, or simply tossed out, this is now your opportunity to make that known. I have a question. Yes, um, uh, Estrada. The operational plans that are mentioned, would those be made public or? So, so the op uh, the operational response plans are, is that what you're referring to the operational mm -hmm. response plans? Yeah, my, my understanding is that the operational response plans are sheriff's policies, uh, which by their nature should should be public. Uh, I don't believe there should be operational response plans um, that are are secretive, um, and they should be according to sheriff's policy. Uh, Lieutenant Cutting, is is your understanding of operational response plans? anything different than an, an open policy that that is known to the public i uh, i mean they're they're subject to pra requests so uh, a little different in that we don't just post our operational plan because it is in fact not an operational plan but they they are often uh, requested through public records act requests i appreciated section c of the operational plans but that, that also, that's why I asked, because I'm just curious how those plans would be developed and how that would be handled. Uh, Mrs. Estrada, when you say you're referring to section C, can you, can you point me to that a little bit more? Section C of what? Of the, of the operational plan section. Oh, okay, so you're referring, okay, so on page two of the policy where it indicates operational response plans should require C, the attempted identification and preparation for the role of hate groups, including white supremacists who wish to disrupt protest and instigate violence. Is that, is that what you're referring to? Okay. Yes. Okay, so yeah, th those operational plans that are within the sheriff's office, that's what Lieutenant Cutting was referring to that would require public request, uh, sorry, public record acts to obtain. Uh, but my understanding is that those are written operational response plans. I don't believe the sheriff's office yet has one in place for the attempted identification uh, and preparation for the role of hate groups. Um, certainly, I, I think that's something we will also talk about in the hiring and firing parts of our uh, discussions when we get to them. Um, but yeah, that, that's what we're recommending as, as the operational response plan to have that included in it. I, I don't think it already does. Is there anybody else who uh, wishes to offer any comment regarding the um, mass demonstrations and crowd management matters? Um, yeah, I had a question. Um, or maybe, I don't know if this is a Lieutenant Cutting question, but on unlawful assembly dispersal orders in the first paragraph where it says, if a public gathering or demonstration remains peaceful and nonviolent, and there is no reasonable imminent threat to persons or property, 
the incident commander should generally authorize continued assistance and protection of the protesters and monitoring of the event. So um, when would, like, what would determine something to be um, no longer peaceful and, and considered violent to then basically trigger all of the officers that we're recommending go in without any sort of um, like the protest unit, what are they called? Um, the operational plans? The, the riot gear, sorry. So we're recommending that they don't show up in riot gear, right? Because it's peaceful. But then what, at, one, at what point would a deputy know that like how violent does it have to get or unpeaceful for them to know that now it's time to put riot gear on? Like, is that at their discretion or um, what sort of acts need to take place? Because I know during the George Floyd protests, like every city that had a protest was kind of different and every law enforcement agency kind of handled it different. And if we saw all of the videos that people uploaded, there were like so many, like some people I saw were like taking batons from police, throwing them over a bridge. I think that happened in Vallejo. Like people were provoking law enforcement. And then we saw um, videos where law enforcement was yelling at, you know, civilians and things like that. So it goes both ways, but what sort of, actions need to take place for like deputies to know when to act differently than how we're basically asking them to show up at a at a protest yeah um when we discussed this in the ad hoc with lieutenant cutting essentially when they are deployed on standby uh, they are in the riot gear that they are prepared for things to escalate. Um, what Lieutenant Cutting told us last time is that uh, in our ad hocs that essentially the, when the sheriff's office, for example, is called to support uh, a situation that they will be in a different area and wait for the call that they are now needed in their gear. Um, but Lieutenant Cutting essentially described to us that they don't have time to change into their gear once they get to a situation um, just simply because they don't know when it escalates to that point and that they need to be prepared when they arrive as opposed to being prepared but not dressed in their full riot gear and then getting in that uh, gear when the, uh, when the threat increases. So, um, you know, we, we discussed with Lieutenant Cutting the fact that when police show up in riot gear, that is increasing the level of anxiety. That's increasing the, uh, it's increasing the message that you are saying to the public. It's no longer, we're here to make sure everybody's safe. It's we're here to control the riot. Um, and, and so the, the perception that the public has when they see a line of officers in riot gear, as opposed to a line of deputies uh, with no helmets uh, in, their, you know, in their more um, standard uniform, uh, is remarkable. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, what we heard from the sheriff's office, it's just a matter of their officer safety and how they uh, are best to prepare for that situation. But uh, as, as we are recommending, they should wear at all possible, um, not have that full riot gear on until it becomes absolutely necessary as the last resort. And that um, the protests or, or Groups should be controlled uh, in manners that do not reflect uh, a riot gear response if and, and when at all possible. Yeah, it's, it's a very different response when, uh, and, and you know, we, we talked about, for example, the protests that have been going on with the, um, with the chicken farms and how the deputies responded in the same gear that they did with the Santa Rosa protests with George Floyd that they were there with their full quote unquote riot gear protections um, on standby because of the number of people and because of the potential that it could turn violence or, or increase in dangerousness. Um, and uh, I, I think the best thing to do is have it in our policies that they should only be deployed in that riot gear as a last resort 
and only when necessary uh, so that we don't have the riot gear response for each and every gathering of a crowd you know, of, of 10 or 20 people. Um, that it's only when, um, when it's absolutely required as a last resort. Is there anybody else uh, who wants to offer comments on this policy? Okay. Then we will move on to our last and final policy regarding use of force before opening this up to public comment. Uh, following public comments, we may bring it back to the CAC, uh, but uh, certainly we wanna hear from our community. Uh, the, the next one is uh, regarding the prone restraint and maximum prone restraint. <clears throat> this has been recently, or, or I, I would like to say recently, but unfortunately all too common that it's been happening where individuals in police custody are dying when they are in a prone restraint position on their stomach, when their hands and feet are restrained behind them, um, when they are uh, in that position and officers are placing pressure on their necks, backs, spines. Um, as a result, we have had in the United States uh, a, a large number of people dying of positional asphyxiation, which is death as a result of the body being in a position that interferes with its ability to breathe. Uh, these are mostly deaths that could have been prevented with proper officer training and with the right policies in effect, uh, such that the individuals are not placed in that position. And if they are, it's for the most limited amount of time possible with constant supervision at all times by a deputy and supervisor interaction and approval at every step. And with the right policy and with the right training and with the sheriff's deputies following the policy, uh, hopefully we can avoid deaths in our community um, like this in, in the future. So uh, we, we first talk about the definitions of prone restraint and maximum prone restraint. Uh, the difference between the two is that a maximum prone restraint often uses um, restraint devices rather than simply a person being uh, in, a, in a physical position. Um, the uh, maximum prone restraint often has the person's ability restricted where they cannot move without assistance. Um, prone restraint without the maximum restraint, but prone restraint is essentially physical restraints of an individual in the prone position uh, on their stomach. We. Uh, inform the sheriff's deputies and, and all those subject to the policy that the use of this restraint and these techniques shall be for limited use in only high risk or violently resisting individuals. And that this uh, restraint should not be used on individuals that are not high risk or violently resisting police officers. Uh, we talk about deputies avoiding applying any weight to a person's upper torso during this process. That's key. We've seen this in almost every death that has occurred from the positional asphyxia, is that an officer or deputy has placed their weight uh, either by their knees or their uh, other parts of their body, that they've placed significant weight on the upper torso of an individual in the prone position such that an individual is telling the officers they can't breathe and they are in pain. Um, and oftentimes, as we've seen, the officer does not release because as we've heard, if somebody is able to say they're not breathing, they must be able to breathe because if you can talk, you can breathe. That was what we've heard for years. If you can talk, you can breathe. We heard it when you give somebody the Heimlich, if they're saying, I'm choking, I'm choking. You're not choking, you can breathe because you're talking. But I think what we've begun to see through the number of deaths that have occurred as a result of this position is that just because a person is saying, is talking, does not mean that they are able to breathe sufficiently that it is not causing them harm and ultimately that it cannot cause their death. So I think it's important in this policy that an officer is told that weight should be, that they should avoid applying weight to a person's torso and that kneeling is prohibited 
unless they are overcoming violent resistance. Body weight should not be used to control an individual's head or neck. And that less resistance offered by an individual, the less body weight that should be applied. If you're not being resisted, you should, be not, you should not be placing force on the upper torso, neck, or back of an individual in the prone position. Additionally, we make sure the deputies are aware of asphyxia as positional asphyxia may lead to sudden death in this situation. And deputies are required to constantly monitor a person and address immediately any medical emergencies that occur. Um, we talk about the symptoms that are involved. We talk about people, uh, special attention being paid by the deputies for individuals who are obese, known to have prior cardiac or respiratory problems, or those individuals believed to be under the combined influence of alcohol or drugs. The reason is because these things clearly increase the risk a person has for death in the prone position and the prone restraint positions. Um, we indicate that no person shall be left unattended while they are restrained. In either the prone position or the supine position with wrist, waist, or ankle restraints, any type of restraints like that requires that the deputies do not leave that person unattended for any reason at any time. We talk about the maximum prone position and we follow it up with uh, individual requiring uh, documentation such that if a deputy places an individual in the maximum prone restraint position, they must document it as a use of force, including the nature of the restraint, the amount of time that they were restrained, the amount of time they were face down, how they were transported and in what position and in what duration that transportation took place. They must also note any medical problems, statements made during prone restraint or after they were taken out of that restraint. This is to monitor their medical issues and their uh, outward signs of pain and all observations of the person's behavior during that time. So it requires the officers when this restraint is used to document, document, document everything that occurs, how long it occurred for and why. And so we feel that because of the, the sheer number of deaths that are occurring, we would be um, neglecting our duties as a CAC to not make these recommendations to the sheriff regarding specifically these prone restraints uh, and these positions that are um, with lack of proper training by deputies in combination, it is uh, killing members of our communities. So I would open up that uh, topic to discussion by our CAC as well, before we open up all of these to the community. Does anybody on the CAC wish to uh, be heard regarding any of these uh, topics, including the last one, the maximum prone restraint and, and prone restraint positions? I'll just, just want to uh, say, oh, sorry. Right. Go ahead, uh, Lores. Ms. Barrera, I just want to say, no, I'm just so, so, so glad that this is here. Um, you know, I, I can't even say enough how important of all of our recommendations that this is. And I'm just really, really glad that we were able to come up with some recommendations around this because what, as you said, Evan, many times what we're seeing in the news and, you know, um, as you say, like my previous experiences and things that I've noticed with my family members engagement. So I just really appreciate that. Um, our recommendations are very relevant and timely, even though this work was happening before a lot of things that happened in our, in this last year that we had no idea and anticipated. But I just think this good work was happening before so that we could, you know, also be, um, what's the word I want? Um, relevant, not just relevant, but address what some things that are really we're hearing in our local community has been a thing, but also nationally. Sorry, Lorena. Thank you, Lorez. Uh, Lorena, you uh, also had some comments? Uh, don't, no need to apologize, Lorez. Um, I think you guys did a lot of great work on this. And I um, I just wanna say that I thought it was important that you clarified how um, 
like it used to be considered being able to breathe just because you could speak and you're basically your air is being cut out. So um, I think having that type of information in something um, is really important because we need to kind of define it, especially when we've seen instances where people can't actually breathe. Even if you're able to speak or say something, it doesn't mean that they're not cutting your air circulation and things like that. So we've seen what it leads to. So it's important to have that in there. Um, thank you for including it. Uh, Mr. Landa Verde, I see you've removed yourself from mute. Do you have uh, additional comment as well? No, I, I, first of all, I wanted to thank you about the presentation. It was just uh, very eloquently uh, given to us uh, and the differences. And we learned so much from the shelving case uh, just several months ago of all of these, you know, experts on, on all of these situations. And so I'm glad it's in the policy. It's very relevant work. It's, and what our hope is that it doesn't happen not only in Sonoma County, it doesn't happen in the country. So uh, thank you. And uh, Ms. Roman Diaz, I saw you uh, take it off mute as well. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I was just remembering when we were discussing this in our ad hoc meeting. And the one thing that just stays in my mind that Brandon said was um, compassion. And, um, and I think that goes a long way. And, and just thinking right now, maybe, I know that we've had it in our recommendations, We'll put a uh, sanctity of life section in there. Could we add that to this uh, this policy, just a little bit, and and just maybe talk a little bit about compassion within the policy? I think I Alma, another thing that Brandon talked about the word dignity, mm -hmm. and something about I believe he said something about it's in training, but it, maybe it's not in policy. I could be wrong. But I think that's what you were talking about too, mm -hmm. is that, you know, dignity and, um, you know, how to treat people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think it would cause, I don't think it causes any harm to put the overreaching uh, compassion and the sanctity of life uh, topics in the policies that are most important, even if it's listed three times in the sheriff's policy. So I don't think it would be a bad idea at all and, and, and to, to add something to this policy, again, specifically regarding um, the, the overall sanctity of life and, and compassion for the individual being restrained. Yeah. I, I just wanna add that that was also talked a lot about in the de-escalation ad hoc and we really wanted to emphasize how important that was and um, repeat it. Even though it, it is, um, I believe it, the policies, the service policies start with that, um, it's still important to keep emphasizing it over and over again because it's such a big part. Yeah, and, and I think this policy, the maximum prone, the, the prone restraint policy may be one where we want to add some language reiterating, uh, reconfirming the uh, sheriff's, um, the, the duty to uh, the sanctity of life and to the compassion of those that they encounter. Yeah. Okay. There was uh, one more, and, and, and I, I don't did, have oh, it. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, my, I, did, I did want to note um, that uh -huh. I was just reviewing the, the overreaching, the de escalation policy. The, the sanctity of life uh, is in there specifically to apply to all uh, policies of the sheriff's office. Mm -hmm. um, the de-escalation as well as all the use of force policies. Uh, so, so it is in the de-escalation, but certainly I, I, I don't think it would, I don't think it does any harm to add it in the policies where it may need a little reminder. Okay. So we'll look at that again uh, when, when we're reviewing that. And I did have, um, I, I had a more of a, like a, I guess it would, it would be more of a comment. I'm just thinking, in um, where it says the symptoms can be, but not limited to bizarre or aggressive behavior, violent toward violence towards others, shouting, uh, paranoia, panic. Um, those those two. Um, and I guess maybe this is a question for Brandon and also the rest of the CAC members. 
<clears throat> I know that sometimes people are put in those restraints because of those reasons. And, you know, how do we di differentiate aggressive behavior and once we put on, put them in another, in, in those restraints, that aggression becomes more. Um, and how do we differentiate when it's a medical emergency or it's a, you know, I don't know. I, I guess I've seen it a couple of times. And to me, uh, you know, if you, if you're putting someone in those restraints, it's in maximum restraints, it's because sometimes they are aggressive. Sometimes they are violent and you're trying to gain control of the subject. But those are also the things that we have to watch out for um, as, as, and I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I'm just uh, posing well, that question. Yeah, and, and uh, I think, you know, in, in this situation, one of the things is we don't want people put in these restraints who are just, sure. you know, doing these things. We only want them put in these restraints when they are violently resisting. So a person who is just shouting and throwing a fit and yelling and, and making it difficult for deputies should never be put in a maximum prone restraint. We are limiting this policy to high risk, violently re resistive individuals um, who are actively violently resisting. So once they're not resisting anymore, they should not be in the maximum prone restraints. They shouldn't be kept there because they were previously resisting. Um, mm -hmm. It's only to gain control and compliance of those actively violently resisting. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, certainly our, 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 certainly the deputies would have to um, evaluate if a person simply is having a medical emergency. I don't want to say simply, those, those are serious. Uh, if a person is having a medical emergency, uh, the sheriff's deputies uh, uh, who are called out and, and who encounter this person hopefully are trained in such a way that they're able to identify that and differentiate it from somebody who may be violently actively resisting their, their contact. Do you and want me to a, comment on that? Yeah, 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 please. Okay. yeah. <laughs> so currently our policy on max restraint, we only use the max restraint if um, a handcuffed person, if, if they're violently restraining against the handcuffs and they're using their legs and they're kicking, or causing destruction. Um, sometimes it can be their, their full body movement. Um, and that's generally in the back of the patrol car. Mental health, if it's a mental health call uh, from the beginning and we, we established that in the very beginning of the call, uh, EMS would be started usually prior to arrival on those. And if it is a uh, mental health crisis the person's in specifically, and that's it, um, generally there's a the ambulance has a process for restraining that person um, they don't go in the back of the ambulance in a max restraint they go in a um, the, the gurney itself has a system that the EMS has uh, so they wouldn't be transported that way does that Thank explain you. it yeah yeah that explains a little bit more <laughs> Okay, so um, are there any other comments regarding the maximum prone restraints uh, or, or any of the other policies that we discussed before we open this up to the public? Okay, so now I would like to open up to uh, public comment. Uh, this is not general public comment, but rather public comment on the issues of the de-escalation and use of force policy recommendations, uh, item number three on our agenda. If you would like to offer public comment on item number three on our agenda and specifically regarding the uh, policies that we will be recommending to the Sheriff's Office, please raise your hand on the Zoom app at this time and we will go ahead and begin calling people. Uh, once we call you, uh, you will be allowed to speak for three minutes. I will be timing that on my end as well. And all are encouraged to um, engage in respectful communications that uh, supports free speech and values diversity of opinion. Please adhere to your time limits of three minutes and let's uh, go ahead and call on our members of our public. I see Allegra Wilson with a hand up. 
Hi. Um, good afternoon or evening. Um, I, I really want to say, like, I appreciate all the work you all have been doing. Um, and, and this is a great start. I have my own perspective and I just wanted to share. Um, De-escalation begins with alternatives to law enforcement and any policy that the sheriff might implement should begin with identifying other potential resources. Um, I would advocate also that in terms of de-escalation, you look at the example being set in Berkeley's police department. Every training on any tactic includes ways in which these situations can be de-escalated. So it's a, a global approach. Every, every single thing you do starts with de-escalation. Um, regarding the use of force in canines, it's evidenced by the situation we saw with Mr. Warwick that the officers can't be relied upon to control their animals and the officers should be held accountable for incidents like this where a dog mauls a human being. Dogs who do not follow command should absolutely be retired and rescued and just in general, setting dogs on people is a brutal practice and should be ended. Um, tear gas should never be used against a crowd. The government shouldn't gas its own people. Um, we shouldn't have to say this because it's a violation of the Geneva Conventions. Um, deputies should avoid attending protests in general because they are known to escalate the crowd. And I would just say overall, I think the problem with any of these policies is always this idea of the last resort. Please shoot people so-called as the last resort. When the last resort is in the eyes of the deputy and when the deputy will always be backed by the officers association and other deputies, and when the standard of evidence is all based on the feelings of the deputy at the time as told after he's had time to get his story straight, the standard is too high. Um, and so I really appreciate what you're working on, but I would ask you to consider to go further the deck is already stacked in favor of the sheriff. So let's see what happens when we stack the deck in favor of the people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next person is Dana Bellwether. Dana Bellwether. Once you're admitted, uh, please go ahead and begin your public comment. You're, you're on mute, Dana. There we go. Great. Um, first, I'd like to mention something on page 17 in the second full paragraph. I would like language that would allow the suspect a wider range of ways to indicate near asphyxiation, because sometimes you can't speak when you're being suffocated. Um, so a darkening of the face or a, a struggle to change position of the torso or anything that a physician could identify as uh, trying to get more air should be taken seriously. It shouldn't depend on ability to speak. On page 14, number five, I'd like to add that projectiles containing tear gas shall be fired over the heads of crowd members, not directly toward the people themselves. Those projectiles are designed to open in midair and rain tear gas down on the people. Um, and this is, this has to do with uh, a life-threatening situation for a suspect, although it's not use of direct force. Um, some, some other people and I were arrested about a year ago for demonstrating on behalf of George Floyd. And one of us told the people in the jail plainly that she was taking immunosuppressant medications. So, and she would, they took away, they threw away her good mask. They gave her one of those little paper things. And on the pretext of protecting her from our germs, they put her by herself in what had to have been the filthiest room in the building. Now it's been a year and she's still alive. So we can hope that she didn't pick up a deadly infection in that filth. But 
if someone is known to be on immunosuppressants, they should be put in a reasonably clean space um, because we don't know, we still don't know whether she may have picked up some pathogen that takes a long time to become symptomatic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, individual is Susan Lamont. And please unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, first of all, I would like to say that people are talking about the fact that um, some of the stuff they really were paying attention to after George Floyd. I would like to point out that Branch Roth, now it wasn't the, it wasn't the sheriff's de deputy, it was a police officer in Lonard Park. But Branch Roth was killed in exactly the same way that George Floyd was. He was passive, he was naked, he was unarmed, and he ended up dead and calling out all the same, all the same words that George Floyd called out. That was four years ago in this county. His people have not been paying much attention. So I would like to say that the, the um, it seems to me that the biggest issue in all of these uh, arenas is the definition of the word control and how much control actually needs to happen. So many of these things are very minor violations, if they are violations at all that you know the person is being arrested for. And the notion that you would that an officer would feel that they have the right to have such absolute control that they would actually risk the life of the person for something quite minor is a real problem. And so a discussion about that, I would think needs to be in the policy. Um, I would also say, my, my son-in-law is a police officer. He is a police officer in another state. He was trained in another state. He said he was trained really well, and he was trained in de-escalation, so the policy is great. And what he found is that it is his fellow officers who don't believe in it, won't use it, and when he uses it, he gets mocked. So actually, it seems that there needs to be a cultural um, shift. I mean, we've talked about this before. Cultural shift needs to happen within law enforcement agencies and by the officers themselves. Um, so I would also add that um, uh, Jason uh, Anglero Wyrick should never have had a dog sit on him at all. That was a failing of the officer. There was nothing happening. He was not doing anything that warranted that. And therefore, this is not a policy about the dog. This is a policy about the officer. And um, riot gear, yeah, riot gear just agitates people. And in terms of losing control of your legs when you're being pressed down, as um, uh, Officer Cutting said, uh, having watched Branch Roth die many, many times over, um, that movement of legs when you are being suffocated is involuntary. It's not something you're in control of. And officers need to understand that. They need to really be aware of what they're, what they're seeing and understand that something else needs to be done that continuing to restrain a person isn't going to help. And that's Thank enough. you, Susan. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Uh, okay, the next person I see for public comment is Kelsey Vero or Vero. Oh, never. Hold on. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi, Kelsey. Yes. Hi. Thank hi. you. Hi. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, 
Yeah, my name is Kelsey. I um, was born and raised here in Santa Rosa. Um, I uh, want to um, amplify what I heard a little earlier um, and from, from several other people about sort of um, considering the presence of police as a form of force and, and a type of escalation in and of itself. And I see that reflected, um, I think, you know, the, the beginning of that um, in these policies, but uh, really, you know, would love to see the CAC and others um, really recognize that alternatives to policing um, and banning certain things entirely may be the appropriate action um, that, that uh, police are there to use force. And if we don't want force to be used, um, we need an alternative. Um, and that also uh, goes with the idea that including when necessary, when deemed necessary at the end of, of every policy or that something shouldn't be used unless absolutely necessary or when the police officer or cop or sheriff says it's necessary is a real loophole. Um, you know, it makes it hard to prove that they were breaking a policy. It makes it us, you know, our word versus theirs. And also we know that um, they lie uh, sometimes and maybe regularly and that body worn cameras can um, help with that, but not always. And it's just a real loophole. And that sometimes when a policy is bad, when a procedure is bad, when something is forceful and deadly and unnecessary in general, that we could just ban it and not leave that loophole in there that says, unless they really wanted to. Um, and that would take us a little further in this way. And I just also wanted to mention that PA system I saw um, in terms of uh, crowds and making sure that people can hear when there's a dispersal order. Um, we just had this come up in talking about the SRPD that when they talked about their PA system that they seem to have been referring to an LRAD, the long range, I can't remember anymore. Anyway, the, it's a weapon, an asonic weapon, and um, to call it a PA system is, in my view, really disingenuous. But just to understand that when we're making policy recommendations like that, we want to watch out for unintended consequences that might involve, for example, the purchase of and use of an actual weapon that might be used against people separately from what was intended. Um, and that was all I had to say. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, uh, no last name listed, but Michael, when you're admitted in, please unmute and then go ahead with uh, your three minutes. Hi, this is Michael Tatone. Um, I wanted to echo a lot of what I heard um, Allegra and Kelsey especially say earlier. Um, I think that, you know, I, I understand that people have, have it. I, I, I don't think, you know, I don't think we should have a, a canine on the force that is a real danger to civilians. I think that's just, we just can't have that. I do, however, feel that, you know, the onus of responsibility needs to be on the department and on the trainers. Um, and taking the dog out of service is not extreme. And someone used that word, I think, but I don't, I don't see that as an extreme action. Um, I am concerned that um, what what is the disciplinary process for officers who continually cannot handle the dogs? Um, they just keep going through and getting recertified, and then you know it, we we keep going through the same thing. At some point, you know there there needs to be actual accountability. Um, and then I agree that uh, tear gas really shouldn't really shouldn't be used against protesters. I'm I'm also interested in when we talk about violent protesters, what does that mean um, in terms of policy? Does that mean that the protesters are engaging in bodily harm? Does it mean that they're engaging in the destruction of property? Because to me, I think that um, property destruction, it's, it's, you know, there, there was, a, you know, there was, there was a certain amount of property destruction that may or may not have been related to the protests. They happened at the same time, but it wasn't really clear if the protesters were involved in it last summer. So, and it, it paled in comparison to the monetary damages to the city of Santa Rosa when they, uh, based on officer use of force. And so, and it just speaks, it's, it's you know, that, that, that's, that's actually not a good example, but it speaks to the level of difference of things that we're considering here. When we talk about violence, 
the violence that police are using against civilians, which has included, you know, shooting people in the face with projectiles, it just pales in comparison to um, the, the breaking of a window. Um, they're not the same type of thing. And I, I would, I don't want, you know, the, lang the language should absolutely reflect that. And um, violence against protesters is, is dangerous because anytime you engage in violence, it encourages people to respond with violence. So, and if what they're doing is property damage, then it's actually escalating from the police end. Um, so I would, I would, you know, I'd love to see more clarification on that. And I'd love to see the sheriff, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to see them, you know, accept policies from this board and not necessarily, you know, go into, you know, tr trying to stall or trying to get more and more seats. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Uh, okay, the next individual is Lee. Lee? Hi, um, I'm Lee. I was driving today, noticing our roads that are in need of repair, our house's community that are, it is need, and shel need of shelter, shelter. And I remembered that all the money is used for a militarized police force instead. Dogs, rescue the dog, fire the handler. That is just an absolute no brainer. Hire a person who is safe, a person who is culturally sensitive and a person who can actually handle an animal. In fact, using an animal, training it to do harm on a human being is pretty screwed up. It literally you know, sounds like a therapy is needed for that. It's draconian at best. Please don't patronize the community pre pretending that, the L that Ellie does not know that gently placing their hand on a firearm is a specific act of escalation. We have LE who escalate. We have always had LE who escalate. They have been trained, they have been retrained, they've been retrained again, and they know exactly how to de-escalate. Thanks to our constitutional right to film the police, we know that this is the norm all over the country. Hundreds of community members witness escalation, and we have yet to see accountability. Law enforcement knows very well that kicking and resisting comes involuntarily. They know, we all know, Everybody knows there is a difference between you can speak when someone's getting the Heimlich maneuver and you can speak for a second when you're getting ready to be killed because someone's stepping on you. Law enforcement knows that they might kill somebody and they press on their chest. They see it on TV. They've seen multiple deaths. They know. They know. Pretending they don't know is simply perpetuating white supremacy. Tear gas is an act of war. It's prohibited by the Geneva Convention. What you just stop that's your 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 recommendation should be let's not do anything that's rec is prohibited by the Geneva Convention. When Martin Luther King marched, law enforcement came and violently attacked those protesting police brutality. The newspaper blamed MLK instead of law enforcement, and here we are again. Same thing. These recommendations are not strong enough. I want to be grateful, but it is hard to be grateful without transparency and accountability. Compassion is not what comes to mind when thinking about our local law enforcement. What comes to mind is the incredible human rights violations that have not been properly addressed. You should all be out outraged and that certainly it doesn't seem like it from these recommendations. I would like them to be stronger. I yield my time. Thank you very much, Lee. The uh, last hand that I see raised currently is Barbara Grisecci. I apologize if I'm pronouncing your last name incorrectly. Barbara. Uh, once you're permitted, go ahead and unmute and we'll start your three minutes when you begin. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you so much um, to the CIC for all the work you've done. I so appreciate that. Um, I was a part of the group that was campaigning for Measure P to try to increase um, for the CIC and I'll arrow to provide the oversight and transparency that's needed of our sheriff's department. So I, I wanted to thank you for what you've done. I would like to say that the canine force um, should disappear. I would like to have officer um, Cutting ask him if he has ever heard of the term chew time with dogs, because I have heard that from law enforcement. Um, as it, 
uh, relates to holding people down and suffocating them out of their life, I think you've, you've done a great job of going a, a fair way. You know, the problem is that the sheriff's department actually is not listening to the CIC or Iolero. And I would like to see them actually respond and do something rather than just sit there and hear recommendations and do nothing. Um, we need our sheriff to be accountable and the system set up for that, but that is what we really need. And I would love to see the sheriff a part of these discussions. So I, again, my question is to Officer Cutting. Have you heard of the term two time? I'd like to hear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Susan McDonough. Thank you. Yes, I'm Susan McDonough. I do appreciate the efforts of the CAC in taking these first steps towards recommendations um, and also the acknowledgement tonight of the deaths at the hands of police. Um, I, I find the use of shall, should, when necessary, when possible, lets the sheriff's office off the hook and uh, makes it virtually impossible to enforce it, especially with uh, the sheriff's common comments that uh, he can't release any information, uh, departmental policy prohibits personnel policies uh, being coming to light, et cetera. So that is a major concern. And I think we have to look at the costs of these uh, to the county for the failure of de-escalation, et cetera. Um, we're talking tens of millions of dollars in lawsuits uh, for people who've been killed uh, or uh, use of excessive force and a 46% increase in the uh, insurance budget um, that doesn't fall on the sheriff's office, even though it's from the suits, it falls on the county's budget. Um, I, I think that we need more accountability in the sheriff's office, and I appreciate these steps, but we need to do much, much more to ensure that these killings stop or these maimings like Mr. Uh, Wyrick's uh, stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, okay, I see uh, Tony Winter. Tony Winter. Hi, everybody. Thanks for all your effort. And I, I do want to echo a lot of the comments that have already been made about the accountability. And um, I do think that the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office should be following the international standards, like people have alluded to the uh, Geneva Convention in terms of the tear gas. We're a model to the world and we shouldn't just rely on local um, California county policies, but look to international standards for how we craft our policies on these topics. Um, I wanted to address a couple of specific things and give you some feedback. The, um, the four concepts of de-escalation de don't really address the dispatch issue. It seems like if you're looking at from the CAHOOTS model, um, the decisions about de-escalation should really start when the call comes in about a, a problem in the community and um, a decision should be made about who is even sent out on that call from the get-go. It may not be, need to be a, a law enforcement officer. Um, so, and some general comments. Um, I liked what Susan said about the, the language giving some outs to the, um, the sheriff's office that all the things that say should probably should have some should have some um, stronger language to hold the accountability in place. Um, I had a question about the language regarding body worn cameras, and it seems like those should be required. And the language in that the phrasing there should be a little bit stronger. And I have, uh, I laughed at the unlawful assembly dispersal orders language that says um, do a lawful act in a violent, boisterous, or tumultuous manner, minus the violence, the, the boisterous and tumultuous sounds like my grandchildren, and I don't think you want to arrest them for, <laughs> for those behaviors. 
So um, I know that's from the penal code, but it, those terms should probably be defined because that could be interpreted in a, in a dubious way. And then I have a general um, comment about documentation. There's a lot of allusion to the need for documentation and Evan, you were very articulate about, about that. But then I'd like to know more about what's done with that documentation and how that's used for learnings. And I'd like to have some public um, transparency about, doesn't need to be the specifics of the documentation, but what the learnings are from that information that's gleaned from the information that we gather in that documentation. So, you know, it's a continual process. This is just the beginning of this process, but we need to be able to take incorporate the information that we get from um, the documentation to further improve all of law enforcement. So thanks for giving us the opportunity to provide you with some feedback. Thank you very much. I do not see any additional hands raised for public comment regarding agenda item number three. Uh, I'll bring it back to the CAC just briefly. If anybody has a, on our CAC, um, we can't really answer questions of public comment, but if there's any uh, further comments before we move on to our next um, agenda item. Uh, if not, then what we'll do is take these back to our ad hocs, take of course our public comment uh, and see what modifications we want to make taking that public comment into uh, mind uh, and seeing what modifications we want to then uh, change for our final recommendations to be presented to the sheriff's office. So thank you to all who offered public comment. It was very, very insightful. And uh, I know we'll, we'll be discussing it more in our ad hoc meetings. All right, now I'm gonna open up, uh, we're gonna move to agenda item number four. This is public comment for items not appearing on the agenda, but within the subject matter jurisdiction of the CAC. For this, please state your name and who you represent if applicable. Comments are limited to three minutes at the discretion of the chairs based on the number of comments and other factors. So at this time, I'm going to open up for public comment. And again, this is public comment on any matter within the subject matter jurisdiction of the CAC. And we'll start with Susan Lamont. Hi, Susan. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it was Ms. Barrera who said this, but I might be wrong. Um, said that there have been complaints from the public that the CAC has not been doing enough over the past year. And I would say that's a complete misunderstanding of what the complaints have been. And I'm going to be, you know, a broken record on this, but. Here you have been working for more than a year on something, and we each get three minutes to comment. In the past, we comment, the work was brought to the public at every meeting. We got to comment and discuss it at every meeting as it proceeded. We got to um, attend some, some ad hoc meetings for public. We got to go to those. So here we are, we got three minutes to comment on this massive amount of material, when in the past, we might have had over the course of that year, 30 minutes a piece. That's actual public discussion. What we have here today is not, it just doesn't even qualify. So I'd also like to comment on um, the sheriff's reaction to the recommendations that come. I don't know how many of you, I'm just going to guess zero, um, were at the Board of Supervisors meeting at which Jerry Street produced his, presented his last report. I don't know how many of you read that incredibly extensive report and the sheriff's reaction. The sheriff's reaction was that of a petulant child who felt he shouldn't have to be criticized at all and how dare anybody say anything, that it was just all personal vendetta. That's the kind of reaction we're we're used to and that just is totally um, unacceptable and uh, i'd like to comment on what what susan mcdonough pointed out about the increased expenses 
You know, a lot of people are saying that they don't like the idea of defunding. Well, those increased expenses come out of some other department's budget. Therefore, somebody's budget is being defunded. So the county believes in defunding. It just doesn't believe in defunding the sheriff. And that's a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, the next uh, public speaker is Barbara Graseshi. Yes, a um, uh, couple of things. The first one, I would like to consider uh, to throw out to the CAC to endorse the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act is up in front of Congress. So I don't know if you had a chance to look at that, but I think it would be great if you were able to offer your support for that. So that that is, um, you know, that is my suggestion. Um, there are also bills going in through Sacramento that around pleading the, unfortunately, the bill around the sheriff's um, classification change in terms of their qualification. There was a bill that came in front of Sacramento to change the sheriff's qualifications before 1980 because they were upset at the sheriff in Sacramento, or, excuse me, in San Francisco County, who did great work. He, his background was as a criminal justice attorney and a civil rights attorney. And he was in place for like, you know, 20 years. But the Deputy Sheriff's Association Union was not happy with that. So they made a change to the law to require many things in terms of post-training and law experience law um, enforcement experience that hadn't been in place before. And there was a bill that was, uh, you know, in front of the Senate that didn't make it. Uh, I think we should consider that. It'll probably come up again. And so I would just suggest that you take a look at that. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, I do not see any other public speakers wishing to make comment. So we will move forward and conclude uh, our CAC meeting. Uh, first, before we do that, I want to congratulate Corey Hernandez uh, on the graduation from Sonoma State University. Corey was one of our awesome interns who helped us with our research and work on our de-escalation and use of force policies. There she is. Uh, and uh, Corey just graduated from SSU and just wanted to uh, offer our congratulations and say thank you to you and to all the other uh, interns that helped us out uh, throughout this year. Thank you very, very much. It was fantastic. Thank you, Corey. No, thank you. It was really fun um, interning for you guys. I definitely learned a lot that I didn't know before. <laughs> so thank you. It's Absolutely. been great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, your help and the help of all the interns was invaluable. It was it was fantastic. Uh, the next CAC meeting is going to be on July 12th. It's going to be at 6 p.m. It will not be July 5th, which is the first Monday because of the holiday. So we will be having our meeting on July 12th. We will be hearing from representatives of Santa Rosa Police Department, specifically regarding their CAHOOTS um, model of policing and, and the CAHOOTS uh, information. And what we're doing with this is it's for us to learn more about it so that we can then see how it may uh, help with our recommendations in the future for our Sheriff's Department and for us to learn a little bit more about the uh, CAHOOTS model of policing. Um, okay, with that, I thank everybody for your attendance this evening. Uh, thanks again to Nzinga Woods, our newest member of the CAC, welcome. And uh, I will see everybody on July 12th. Thank you very much. And thank you to our members of the community for joining us as well. Good night, everybody. <laughs>